It is an absolute joy to be with you this morning. I had the privilege of being with you folk uh, back in 2012. Actually, I was with young people and then later with the parents of teenagers and the teenagers, and we had a precious Sunday together, and that's made me look forward to being back here. Another reason I feel a closeness with this church is because Ryan was one of my students at the seminary. Now, Ryan came to the seminary in the little bus, if you understand. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Ryan is an absolutely wonderful and gifted young leader, and I am loving watching his effectiveness in ministry among you folk. So that just makes it more fun and to, to come and actually see how some of your students turn out. Uh, another nice thing about being with you today is... I got to drive in my car almost every Saturday of the year. I go to DFW Airport and I fly somewhere to preach or speak on Sunday, and that's fine. But today, no airports. I just got to get in the car and come. Uh, actually, that solves some problems. I knew I'm not quite as young as I used to be, and I knew eventually my age was going to be a problem at DFW Airport. And last weekend was the weekend it became a problem. You just have to love our TSA officers out there. Last week, they would got my little rollerboard, and they were just rummaging through the rollerboard, and they found the Bengay. They knew I was packing heat, and it nearly scared them to death. <laughs> so I had to go in the little room, you know, and get patted down. But, you know, given the date, I just sort of counted that my early Valentine and just went on my way. And... Uh, <laughs> But this weekend, I didn't have to mess with any of that. I just got to drive and be with you and be fresh and ready to preach and teach today. I actually think we're going to have a great time just thinking some new thoughts about lots of things, including families. Uh, let me just kick off by asking you a stimulating question. You probably came out this morning hoping that you were going to think a few new thoughts, so let's just try that out. If you were an atheist. If you, in your heart of hearts, believe there is no God, we're down here by ourselves. If you believed that, but you had kids at home, then what would be your goal in parenting? Now, I know this is hard for you because your faith is so much a part of everything that you hope and dream for your kids and whatnot, especially if you still have children at home. But even if you want to think about grandkids, if you were an atheist and you were a parent or a grandparent, what would be your goal in rearing up those children? Okay, now while you're thinking that over, I had a little drive time this morning to think through my answers. So let me just give you my guesses while you're thinking about yours. Number one, I think an atheist that has children at home would say, my number one goal is I want to see my son or daughter successful at whatever they take on. I want to see them get a good job, make some good money. That is what I want to see. So if that is their number one goal, to say I want my kids to be successful, then back that back into the, let's say, the teenage years, and all of a sudden it's a real big deal to me. Are my kids making good grades? Are they going to go to college? What kind of SAT scores are we going to have? Are we going to get a scholarship? All that becomes very important if my number one goal is I want to see my kids successful. I think they might say that their number two goal is I want my kids to be loved. I don't want to see my kid as an adult, lonely, all alone, maybe even be in a family. So, once again, if, if you're an atheist and you don't want your child to be lonely someday and you want them maybe even to have a family, then, let's say, during the teenage years, then it's a real interesting subject to me. Oh, I hear a little rumor that somebody likes my daughter. That's interesting. Or, I wonder who my son might take to prom this year. You see, that's interesting to me because I'm already processing when my child gets grown, is somebody going to love my child? Will my child be lonely and all alone? I'm guessing for the atheist, their third highest goal would be, I don't know what kind of vocabulary an atheist would use, but I think in general, their third highest goal would be, I want my kid to be a decent human being. You know, don't be a bum. 
pay your taxes, don't beat your wife, you know, just kind of be a normal person. I, I think they would say that's important. And so, you know, if mother has got her little five-year-old at Walmart and the little five-year-old is just acting terrible, she may reach over there and give him a little pop on the bottom. Well, what's her goal? Her goal is, I want this kid to be a decent human being. So, you know, if you have kids at home or maybe if you have teenagers at home, you're saying, hey, don't you dare get pregnant. Don't you be smoking a lot of dope, unless you live in Colorado, but otherwise don't be smoking a lot of dope. So, so, you know, you're just kind of saying those things that you would say as an atheist trying to get a decent kid out of the deal. Okay, if my guesses are anywhere near correct, that an atheist would say what I really want is to see my child succeed in whatever he or she takes on. I want to see my kid loved. I want to see my kid in relationships, maybe even in a family. I want to see my kid raised up to be, you know, a moral, upstanding person. If those guesses are on target, then that raises a very interesting question for us in this room. The fact that you're not an atheist, the fact that you don't just believe there's a God, but you actually know him through his son, Jesus Christ, how does that change your list? I wonder if anyone this morning would say, well, Brother Richard, those are certainly three nice things. I, you know, we do want our kids to earn a living, support themselves, and, and of course I want somebody to love my child someday, and of course we want them to grow up and be, you know, normal, moral human beings. Uh, but if we could just add number four, if we could just add number four, I would like to know that my child is going to get up and go to somebody's church as an adult. Yes, sirree. If I just knew they were going to darken the doors of some church, then I would be... No, I don't think you would be satisfied. I think those of you that got out of bed this morning, got to early church, you are here because you have hopes and dreams for your child or your grandchild that goes way beyond just darkening the doors of a church somewhere. So this is the question. This is the question. If those three things an atheist would do, what for you trumps all of that? What would you move up higher than those three things? Another way of saying it is, what is your primary goal in parenting your children or influencing your grandchildren? What is that? All right. While you're thinking that over, once again, I've been in the car this morning, so let me just go first. And I'm going to tell you about my family. My wife loves teenagers as much as I do, and that's interesting because I've worked with teenagers almost every day of my entire life. I became a youth pastor when I was a teenager, and I've been loving and caring for them ever since. If you went out on the parking lot right now and looked at my RAV4, you would notice my little license plate says TABP. I pay extra because it just keeps reminding me of this little phrase, teenagers are beautiful people. They really are the focus of my life. So when I fell in love with a young lady and discovered that she loves teenagers as much as I do, boy, that was a celebration. So if you've got man and wife that both love kids, you kind of hope that you're going to have a house full of your own kids. I mean, that's reasonable. And my wife and I discovered we were going to have big trouble making babies. I'll save you lots of the story, just fast forward nine years into marriage to the day that I could announce to my youth group the most exciting news, the Rosses are finally going to have a baby. And the teenagers were doubly excited when I was able to say, we just had a sonogram and there are two little girls in there. We had a wonderful shower there at the church. We had a nursery with two of everything. And in a syndrome that is unique to twins, we lost those girls at birth. And the doctors came to say, another part of this tragedy is it is now so unlikely that you will ever be pregnant again. So now let's go 16 years into marriage. Beside my dad in the hospital with a heart attack, a very dark season in my life. And that hospital phone rang, and it was my wife to say, Richard, I have taken this pregnancy test three times, and I am pregnant. 
And the result of that pregnancy was and is Clayton, my one and only living child. To look at my face, you would assume I'm a grandparent like some of you, but actually that's not the case. I have a young son that you might even call college age or just a year beyond that. He is a delight to me for a thousand different reasons. This morning, actually about four o'clock this morning, I prayed for Clayton a particular way. And what makes that interesting is the morning after my wife called me to say, I'm expecting, I started praying for him this way then. Now, it took a couple of <laughs> doctor's appointments before I knew what kind of pronoun to use, he or she, but when I knew exactly what pronoun to use, this is how I started praying for my boy. And if you had seen me at four o'clock this morning, you would have seen pretty much this same prayer. Lord Jesus, in this case, would you give me a son who every morning of his life would just walk into the throne room of heaven? Would you give me, in this case, a son who couldn't even imagine starting the day without standing before you, King Jesus? And would you give me a son who approaches you not primarily to ask for things, he primarily approaches you, Jesus, to glorify you and just praise your name and to be in awe of your glory? Would you give me a son whose heart and whose voice would praise you morning after morning as a third grader or a sixth grader or now a college student, would you put it in the heart of my son at the beginning of the day to glorify the King of Kings? And Lord Jesus, over time, could you allow my son to be so amazed with the glory of who you are that over time my son would be transformed more into your image would you give me a son who little by little has the aroma of Christ on his life and Lord Jesus as my son turns to begin his day would you put it into the heart of my son to say Lord Jesus this day would you come and live through me not living for Christ that's not even in the Bible would you King Jesus come and live through me because if you mighty King are living your powerful life through me, you are going to make things happen. Your kingdom is going to come on this earth, right there in my fourth grade classroom, right there on my college campus. If you are living through me, your kingdom will come more on the earth. And the only possible result of your kingdom coming on this earth is the glory of God. Now, why would any parent pray that prayer. Well, there's a clear reason. Clayton Allen Ross is on planet earth for the king's glory. That's what he's doing down here on this earth. And there is nothing unique to Clayton about that at all. That is the reason each of your children and each of your grandchildren are here. They are here for his Glory, they are here to complete the absolutely unique and remarkable mission that Jesus created for them in his mind before he created the universe. So if that's what they're doing down here, then wouldn't the great desire of any father and mother be, Lord Jesus, would you place it in the heart of my child that they will complete the whole reason that you put them on the earth? Of course, that is the point. Now, they do need to know how to get a job. They do need to support themselves. We do hope somebody will love them. Those are all things that matter. They're just not the most important thing. Your son, your daughter, your niece, your nephew, they are not the result of a random sperm race. They are not the result of some kind of random event in the cosmos that somehow just formed them, this child that is on your mind right now was imagined, created, formed in the mind of God before the creation of the world. And at the very moment that child was being envisioned by him, that unique mission was being crafted at the same time. What matters is whether or not during their brief years on earth that they complete 
that mission that they were placed down here to complete. If we're not careful, we just lose focus. It is so exciting to put that new trophy on the mantle. It is so exciting to watch that boy kick the winning goal or to see a daughter get roses on the 50-yard line, and we get so caught up in that. The possibility of a great college scholarship coming, it just makes our heart beat fast. And if we're not careful, we begin to think that really is the most important thing. Now, most of you, though not all of you, most of you would say, Brother Richard, I might say things a little bit differently, but basically, I'm I'm agreeing with everything you say. Actually, I'm, I'm sitting here this morning, and what beats in my heart is, I want to see my kids, my grandkids, I want to see them glorify Christ. I want them to complete whatever assignment they've been given on the earth. Okay, for you, if that's your heart, then the issue for you is, how does that which is inside you, how does your desire for his glory, how does that get on a 10-year-old? How does a 15-year-old boy get out of you, absorb from you, this desire to live life in such a way that the king is glorified on the earth? How does that actually happen? Well, I'm a professor at the seminary. I live in the world of research. I help people get PhD degrees. And I guess I could have impressed you by going by the seminary and getting a wheelbarrow loaded up with research projects to say, people, right here, that's the research. We know how one generation tends to absorb the faith of another generation. I guess I could have impressed you with all of that. But I decided to just use a symbol of all that research, just a symbol. This is just a pipe. It's from Home Depot, my other religion. (laughs) This piece of pipe probably has 1.6 million American airline miles on it because I can't find anything better to show you what all the research says. If your faith is going to move smoothly to the kids you care about, that faith has got to transfer through something. It's got to move through something. There has to be a conduit that is carrying something from your heart to their heart. That conduit we might call a pipe this morning. Something's got to carry it. If my Clayton had driven over with me today, it would be so interesting to bring him up on platform and for me to put one end of this pipe against my heart and to put the other end of this against Clayton's heart and then to say to you, if the faith of this dad is going to be the faith of Clayton, it's going to have to move through something. Of course, that would leave the $64,000 question, then what is the pipe? What is that conduit that's carrying my faith? So glad you asked because it brings us to the text for the morning. Actually, instead of asking you to turn in your Bible, I'm going to ask you to look at me. And I'm going to give you the teaching of Scripture that answers that question. How is faith going to move from one generation to the next? God was really disappointed in the nation of Israel. They had uh, been very disobedient. And one of the ways he was going to show them his displeasure was he was not going to talk to them for 400 years. That is a pretty good punishment. Now, if God is going to go silent for 400 years, that's the period between the the Old and New Testament, wouldn't you assume the last thing in recorded Scripture, wouldn't you imagine that the last thing is going to be pretty important? Well, yes. Now, you good Bible students, you're already jumping ahead of me. What is the last verse of the Old Testament? Can I show you? Can I just show you the last verse? Not ask you to turn let me show you prophet is speaking of the messianic age to come and as he speaks of the messianic age this is what he says and he will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and he will turn the hearts of the children to the parents 
It's the turning of hearts. It is the connection of hearts. 400 years later, God hadn't said one thing for 400 years. The first time he speaks to break the silence, he is actually speaking through an angel. This is his first spoken words in 400 years. He is speaking through an angel to Zechariah, and nine seconds into the angel's speech, you know what the angel says? Look at me. Nine seconds into his speech, he says, and he will turn the hearts of the parents to the children. It is exactly the same phrase we ended the Old Testament with. I think it's like bookends. It's kind of like two bookends and God's saying, would you please pay attention? I'm fixing to show you how one generation infuses faith in the next generation. It is a connection between their hearts. It's the relationship. It is the warmth and the closeness and the richness of a relationship between a parent and a child that allows that faith to move easily. Now, this isn't rocket science. I know that. If I were a teenage boy, let me just be a teenage boy. I'm telling you, I love my dad. My dad's a good man. Now, he's busy. He's got a lot of stuff to do. But you know what? I catch my dad. He wants to be with me sometimes. In fact, I catch him changing his schedule sometimes just because he wants time with me. And you know, even if he's busy, sometimes he just says, son, go get in the truck. I got stuff to do, but there's nobody on earth I'd rather be with today than you. Come on and go with me. And me and my dad, we can talk about real stuff. Not just who needs a shirt tomorrow, who needs a ride. I mean, he's interested in my life. He listens to my ideas. He wants to know my thoughts about things. I mean, we can really talk. But you know, I'm a kid, and I mess up sometimes. In fact, sometimes I just downright disobey. I'm sorry to say that, but I do. And you know what? My dad is not going to let that pass. My dad's not going to give me a pass when I do something that's wrong. He is going to give me some punishment or something to let me know that I did wrong. But you know what? He just gives me some punishment, but he doesn't scream in my face. He doesn't curse me. He doesn't holler at me and make me feel like I'm about that tall, worthless. He just, you know, does something to let me know that I've messed up. And then we're back to being friends again. I'm telling you, I love my dad. Doesn't it make sense? If there's just basic closeness between any age of child and parent, doesn't it make sense that that child is just drawing the best of that parent into themselves, of course. And those of you that happen to have teenagers say, well, Richard, I I hope that's true. To be perfectly honest, occasionally I'm saying something to a teenager and my daughter's rolling her eyes and yawning. I hope what you're saying is true. My, My friend, it is true. I told you I've been working with teenagers for 40 years. Sometimes when they're rolling their eyes, We youth leaders know you can go find that girl three years later and she can tell you word for word the wisdom that came out of her mother's mouth. Not only that, she has absorbed that into her life. Now the principle does work, but the opposite of the principle works as well. If parent and child drift apart, if we fall into a habit of just hollering at each other, getting into it over nothing, if my way of disciplining primarily is to scream at people and holler at people and get mad, if our schedules are so absolutely crazy that we're not even together enough to have a heart connection, look at me. These older children and teenagers get disconnected. And when they get disconnected, their tendency is to turn out here to their bigger world of friends and activities. And as they get older, they're doing more and more out here. And eventually, they're going to find a couple of soulmates, thunk, and they give them the pipe. Now, people, some of you are real nervous about peer pressure, but you listen to me. Peer pressure is not a significant issue if mom and dad have the pipe. But if we let that relationship dissipate and they give their heart to another, the person that has the pipe has the influence. The pipe doesn't know the difference. The pipe just continues to suck in. But instead of the great deep faith and morality and virtue and character of godly parents, it's going to suck in whatever is out there. And that is who that young person is going to become. 
So it could be for some of you this morning, you would say, this is all making sense to me. And it does sound based on Scripture. I, I think the relationship is the, the, the foundation. And i got to go home and give attention to getting that pipe back. Sometimes parents of 17-year-olds will follow me out on the parking lot and they'll say, Brother Richard, things are not well at our house. We do get into it. You wouldn't believe some things that are said in our house. And actually, I wept a little during the message this morning. Can you give me any hope that I could get my daughter's heart back? Absolutely. And I don't speak from an ivory palace. I don't speak from a seminary. I speak from being a youth leader who has watched families for years. When mom and dad and grandparents purpose in their heart, we're going to rebuild this relationship. In 99% of the cases, those kids are resilient and they will reopen their hearts to parents. So here's the question. If by the grace of God, maybe you have a fourth grader this morning or a third grader, and you would say, by God's grace, relationships are pretty good at our house. And actually, I'm glad to be hearing a lot of this this morning because it's going to make me more careful to watch out for that relationship and to speak into that relationship. Or maybe you're a parent of a teenager and you say, you know, I think by the grace of God, if we go home and give a lot more attention uh, to spending time together and we look at each other and we listen to each other more and we, we discipline with just clear consequences instead of drama and screaming and hollering, I feel like if we do those things, I feel like we can get a lot of that closeness back. If we all end up with pipes in place, then my second question to you this morning is, what do you have to put in the pipe? If the pipe is in place, spiritually speaking, what is going on with you spiritually that your son and daughter needs? I want you to listen to me and never forget what I'm about to say. You'll forget me in an hour, but I'm hoping you will never forget what I'm about to say to you. What will determine what your child looks like spiritually when they are about 27 or 30? What will determine who they are spiritually? Primarily, that will depend on the condition of your heart spiritually today. Say, Brother Richard, I burn a lot of good gasoline bringing my kids up here for all kinds of stuff. Don't tell me that doesn't matter. Well, it does matter. And what happens here at church is a wonderful support. It reinforces what you're doing at home. It builds on what you're doing at home. It fills in the little chinks and the missing pieces. Of course, it's worthy of your time in gasoline. But you can't hope that those good people up at the church are going to infuse in my kids spiritually what they need when they can't possibly find that in me. You can't hope for that. I, I want to show you something. What if I invited everyone in the congregation to just put everything down and stand up? What if everybody just stood up and I ask all of you to walk to the front and stand in one of several places? What if I said, I would like to have one group stand right here. And if you come and stand right here, boy, you talk about loving on you. We would be so thrilled you're here this morning. What if I said we would like to have a group that would stand here to say, I am on a journey toward God. Not an atheist, not me. I actually believe somebody's out there. And I got up this morning, I got myself dressed, and I got down to a church house because I'm trying to figure all this out, and I'm asking some really interesting questions. Can you actually know God? If you came and stood here, Man, you would be a valued guest this morning. We would love on you. In fact, some of you that have been baptized and had your name on a church roll might even say, I'm not absolutely certain that I have a personal relationship with God through Christ. So today I might stand right here myself. Now, others of you could come forward and you would stand right here. And you would say, by standing here, Brother Richard, there was a day I was on a journey toward God. But somebody explained to me that you can actually know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Somebody explained to me that when Christ was dying on the cross, he was actually paying a penalty, a price for my sin. That's, that was the barrier between God and me. And through his death and my 
understanding that gift and by faith believing that that gift would give me life with God forever, through that experience, I'm no longer on a journey toward God. Now I actually know him. He is in my life. But I'm standing here and not some other places because the central issue in my life every day is me. What is on my mind most every day is me. My problems, my hard times, my health issues, my crazy adult children. What's on my mind most of the time is my life, my prosperity, whether I'm respected in this community, things I have to deal with. That's what's on my mind. And you know, I'm so glad that I have Jesus in my heart because we all have hard times. And if you have Jesus in your heart, it's almost like a little mascot. It's almost like having a little friend that rides with you through the day because you can always pull out a little Jesus and he can poof some of those problems away. I don't know what people that are lost do because I've got Jesus. I just am able to bring him all of my difficulties and he can make it all better. Very glad I'm a Christian, but really I'm the central issue. He is small. Now, the people that could come and stand here probably wouldn't come stand here. They're too humble. Probably somebody would have to bring them over here and say, you stand right there. But however somebody ended up here, by standing here, this person would be saying, there was a day I did not know God. Somebody explained to me how I could know him through a great moment of faith in my life and the death of Christ in my place. I received him. And you know what? I cannot take credit for anything that's happened in my life. All I know is the central issue in my life every day is Jesus. He is what's on my mind. When I get up in the morning, there is nothing more important to me than just delighting in him in worship. That's the way my day begins. And then for the rest of the day, the issue always is how today, as I teach my public school classroom, as I work down at the shop, the issue always is how will he move through me today to do something that brings him glory? And man, I do have problems. I've got my share of problems, absolutely. But every time a problem comes into my life, my question always is, hmm, I wonder what the king is going to do through this obstacle to deepen me, and I wonder how he's going to take this situation to win glory for himself. So even in my hardships and my obstacles, he still is the center of attention. Lost, convert, and to use Jesus' favorite term, disciple. You want to see some research? Not goofy research, good research. If I spend 18 years watching mom and dad, maybe good people, maybe moral people, but if I watch mom and dad not know God personally, barring a few miraculous exceptions, I will spend my entire life lost. And the great sadness here is mom and dad go to a terrible place of torment for eternity. And then in addition to the torment, they have to watch those steel doors open one at a time. And each of their kids in turn come to join them there because the pattern team tends to replicate one generation after a generation. Now there are exceptions and a few of you in this room are the miraculous exception. But if I watch mom and dad who are separated from God, the probability is I will spend my adult life separated from God. If I spend 18 years watching mom and dad who are disciples and around our house, Jesus is the deal. Not in a goofy way, but he's just the central issue in our lives. We talk about him easily when we're trying to figure out what our family's gonna do about different situations. He is the one we are focused on. I can tell my mom and dad are in love with him. He is what permeates their lives. If I watch that for 18 years, with a few exceptions, I will become a disciple. And when I'm off at the university and on my dorm hallway is one bulletin board that says, spring break, one month, be drunk on the beach five days, exchange motel keys with everything that moves. And on the other side of the hallway is the bulletin board that says, 
Spring break, go with us to Haiti. We're going to rebuild an orphanage. I take this one because that's who I am, and that sounds twice as much fun as being falling down drunk. It's just because I came out of this home, and now living as a disciple is the most reasonable way for me to live. Lost people make lost kids. Disciple people make disciple kids. Converts make kids who act as if they are lost. Do you want to hear some brand new research? We used to think that kids at church had a faith even through their teenage years, and then they went off to the big bad university and they lost their faith. We don't believe that anymore. When you're a child, even a teenager, there are some constraints around you. There are some rules around you. There's some school rules and mom and dad have rules and the community has rules. And, And I'm constrained as a teenager to behave a certain kind of way. But you take me off to the university or trade school or military and all the restraint is removed. What we're discovering is these kids out of these homes, they don't lose their faith. They just show you the faith that's always been there. And it is a faith so weak, it will not, it will not sustain them in a young adult world that's pulling them in another direction. And after they take your grandkids through about three messy divorces in a row, you may say, this has not turned out like I planned at all. Now, I can't read minds, but I just wonder. At this moment, I just wonder if there is somebody in this room that is thinking this thought. I wonder if somebody at this very moment is saying, Mr. Ross, to use your silly little scenario, I would be standing in the middle. And you know what? I'm okay with that. I make a good living. I've got a decent house. I'm somewhat respected here in the community. I've got what I would call a pretty good life. Now, I would be in the middle, by the way you describe things, but I'm okay with that. I come down here on the church on Sunday morning, and I fit in. I've kind of learned the words that you're supposed to say. I fit in fine, and I don't have people here in Ennis thinking I'm some kind of atheist, so it's good to come down here on a Sunday morning. And you know what? Mr. Ross, you won't like hearing this, but if my kids turned out just like me, I actually would be fine with that. I do want them to get up and go to church. I do think, you know, you can sell cars easier if you go to somebody's church and whatnot. I I would want them to go to somebody's church, but I don't want them to be religious nuts. So if they could just be like me, I would actually be okay with that. My dear friend, it isn't going to turn out that way. Those kids watch a religious profession on Sunday. They see us being religious people on Sunday. But if they can tell from noon Sunday through the rest of the week, that is not the center of our home and family. It fries their wiring. Now, we adults, we middle-aged adults, we have some reasons why going to church is a value to us. But the young adults, not so. They have no reason for going to anybody's church house if your faith is weak. And they're not going to go, and they're going to choose a morality that will break your heart in two. So here's the issue. I could have come this morning with some simple little fluffy sermon about parents and families and we would have all felt good and you probably would have patted me on the head later. But the Holy Spirit is not allowing me to do that this morning. I honestly believe, I I, I have had the conviction of the Holy Spirit in my heart for several hours this morning. I honestly believe that for some of you this morning is a fork in the road. I honestly believe that. Now, you're going to forget me in no time, but I wonder for some of you if the fork in the road is not going to determine a great deal about the future of your home. The issue is, 
Even if I get along with the kids pretty good, the issue is what is it that I'm going to put in there? And what I want to suggest to you is if you find yourself in this kind of spiritual condition right here, even if the pipe is in place, what you give your son or daughter, what you give your grandchildren will not be enough to sustain them and they are going to live their adult lives over here. That is how this is going to turn out. So here's my challenge to you. My first challenge to you, adult, is to rediscover your first love in Christ. Just exactly as Jesus was saying to one of the churches in Revelation to say, you lost that first love, and I want you to get it back. Now, a few of you were believers when you were teenagers. Some of you would say, I can remember those sweaty youth camps. I can remember those late night prayer meetings. Oh, I can remember that mission trip when we prayed until midnight. There were times in my life I have been so close to God, and I do not know what happened to that. For your sons and daughters to get up a little bit early so they can walk into the throne room of heaven to worship their king, the only way that's ever going to happen is for mom and dad to have fallen back in love with Christ and they have already been up before the king. Tomorrow morning, it, it is a clear choice for you to say, well, I grasp those last minutes of sleep or for the glory of Christ and the good of my children, will I get up before him not to beg and ask for things, but will I primarily tomorrow just tell him I'm falling in love with him all over again, that he is going to be the central issue in my life. And whatever is before me on a Monday, wherever I work, whatever I do, the issue is going to be, Jesus, come on. Just rip through me and let's go do stuff that draws attention to you. The first issue is mom and dad rediscovering their first love in Jesus Christ. The second issue is you being transparent enough for your kids to see that. The second issue for you to be transparent enough for your kids to see that. If I took all the grade schoolers and all the teenagers to another room this morning and I interviewed them one at a time, if I asked them, is your daddy head over heels in love with Jesus, what would they say? If I asked them, does your mother move through the day consistently looking for ways that Jesus is just going to live through her to do things that glorify him, what would she say? Well, you might say, that is me, but I'm not sure I tell my kids that often enough. If my daddy says, come over here, look at this verse I found. Man, Jesus just blessed me this morning. That little conversation right there is worth about a hundred Sunday school lessons down at the church because it's my daddy that said that. Rediscover your first love. Be transparent about your faith in front of your kids. The third thing I want to say to you is, you just decide under his leadership I'm gonna lead at my house I'm gonna do those things at my house that can actually move my kids forward spiritually and I'm gonna partner with my church to get that done you get an envelope lead leaving this morning just looks like a brown envelope no my friend that's the next chapter of your life. To say the first order of business is i got to fall back in love with Jesus myself. The second thing is I just have to be open about that in front of my kids. But the third thing is i got to figure out what am I supposed to say? What am I supposed to do? What kinds of experiences can we have in this house that boosts my kids toward Jesus? The church is willing to stand with you. Now, not all churches are. In fact, most churches aren't saying anything to mom and dad about their role in the home. But this one is. And most of you who otherwise might have dropped an envelope in a trash can on the way to the parking lot, today that all of a sudden becomes valuable because it's causing you to say, hey, I didn't go to anybody's seminary. I don't have any Bible school degrees, but you know what? I got this, and this is going to show me the things that I can do myself that affect my kids' spiritual future. <clears throat> My son 
as a 20-something, has a heart for Muslim people, especially the young men. And he goes over to the Middle East on short-term mission trips to drink coffee with those guys and tell them about Jesus. And it's not safe over there because people don't like us very much. The last time my son went, our International Mission Board hired a soldier with an AK-47 to just sort of hang around and watch these boys talking about Jesus. If my son comes home from the next short mission trip in a box and you drive over to Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth for the memorial service and you look down on the second row, you're going to hear me crying as loud as any daddy has ever cried at a funeral. You know why? Because I love my boy so much. If he walks on our campus and he sees me, he'll walk halfway across the campus just to give me a bear hug. We love each other. And I'm going to do some serious crying if I'm not to see him again on this earth. But if you walk up to me at the end of that service and you say, Hey, Brother Richard, you came to our church, you know, there in Ennis. And I don't know, I just felt a connection with you and I heard about this tragedy. So I just thought I'd drive over to Fort Worth for the service today. And by the way, I noticed you were crying pretty loud in that service. So I just have one question. How do you feel about the fact you only had one child and now he's dead and you'll never have a grandchild now? On Christmas Eve, you and your wife will just exchange one gift apiece, and that'll be the end of that. Eventually, you'll end up in the nursing home, and nobody will ever come see you. I just wanted to know how you feel about how this thing has turned out. Do you know what I think I will say? You already heard it musically this morning. It is well with my soul. My son was down here for the king's purposes. And if the king purposes, you're just going to be a 20-something, and then you're going to help establish the church on the blood of the martyrs. If that's the king's decree, any father has to say, it is well with my soul. But my friend, there is nothing at all unique about Clayton. Your son and daughter equally are here for the glory of God. And for us to have sons and daughters who would live, or if need be, die for his glory we got to have moms and dads and even grandparents who would live or, if need be, die for his glory. To have sons and daughters that walk into the throne room of, of heaven every morning, we got to have moms and dads that have already been up and have been there ahead of them for his glory.